Hey, how's it going? The DJI Inspire 3 is a true marvel of modern technology. It shoots 8K on a full frame sensor and can fly for 20 minutes with an amazing gimbal that just makes everything buttery smooth. It's just amazingly convenient and easy to use on set. This has made it one of the most regarded filmmaking tools for drone operators worldwide. However, it is kind of big. What if we could get similar features, but in something that can fit in the palm of your hand? Well, that is the challenge that me and my team have taken over the last weeks, and I'm happy to show it to you today. Here comes the Mini Inspire 3. Looks great, doesn't it? All right, enough with the clickbait. But what if we still wanted similar capabilities to the ones that we can find on the Inspire 3, just with the smallest size possible? Well, we may have a solution. A few weeks ago, I got a text from Martin who works at House of FPV and he had spotted something quite interesting. And it came from a guy called Clark Loopton. By the way, give Clark a follow on Instagram for him and his company. I'll just leave them here. He's great. I mean, thanks for the ID. He shared it with the world and that's what I like to see. He had come up with a solution to combine a very tiny Cinewhoop and a very tiny gimbal to create something that is quite interesting. At first we thought it was just a very cute setup. And then we thought, what if we made one of them and gave that a go? Enters our mini version of that drone. Isn't it cool? Little gimbal underneath it, little camera here. So how is this little bundle of fun made? Well, for us, we started with a Pavo 25 as a base. It's a nice Cinewhoop from Beta FPV. It flies great, I've been happy with it with a naked GoPro, so I figured it would be a good base um, to carry that extra weight. And then there's the gimbal. The gimbal is an HEQ gimbal that is made specifically for the DJI 04. To finish it all, we have a walk snail set up here that allows me to see with a picture and picture system. But I will give you more details on that in a future video. I think the way I use the walk snail system in order to have both picture and picture and see what my camera operator is framing when we use gimbal deserves its own video. But just know that we chose to use a walk snail system. This gimbal still has a lot of limitations. One of those being the rotation on the pan because as you will see here it locks. So this is my, the front of my drone and then here it locks and here it locks too. I'll give you the details on the degrees exactly but just know that you can't do a full 360. So you can either look forward or backwards but you can't do both with one setup. That brings its own set of challenges. For us, that meant that we had to find a solution in order to be able to use it efficiently. When I consider whether I'm gonna use something or not on set, the way I think of it is really, what can it bring that I'm, I don't have currently and how efficient is it gonna be on set? So I try to see everything through that lens and it really helps when you have a setup like this because there are a lot of limitations to it and the key is to find ways to go around those limitations. For example, the limitation on that one is you can either look forward or backwards, meaning that you have to find a way to flip it around very easily on set, otherwise it won't be usable. So what we did is that we simply used a dual lock system, meaning that I can easily just remove it here, turn it to whichever degree I like, by the way. I could do just a 90 degree turn if I wanted to. And then I have it looking forward now. 
So that means super efficient ways of going from one to the other. And that is really important because when you're creating, what you don't want to have is be limited by the tools that you have at your disposal. So this is a good way of just going from one to the other in a few seconds. Like, oh, I want it to be looking backwards. No problem. There it is. Boom. It's there and ready. Simple as that. That really comes from the obsession of being efficient on set. And that is something that I encourage you to really do every time you have a solution or a tool that you'd like to use. Think of it as how helpful it is on set, how convenient it is for me to use it to go from one setup to another if it has multiple setups. And I think this is a great example of something that you can do to make things faster. The dual lock, of course, is not without its own limitations. The O4 gets really, really hot, meaning that it can potentially just detach from the whole thing. Luckily, there's always cables that will keep holding it, but I still don't want to have to deal with that. So far, we haven't had that issue come up yet, but it is something that is possible. But we think that the convenience far outweighs the problems that you can potentially have in the future. As you can see, that setup is currently in a underslung position, meaning that the camera and the gimbal is under the drone. But we could very well think of a way to have an overslung system as well, which is that something that we plan to do in the future. Each underslung and overslung offer different possibilities for different shots. So we think that we're going to build one as well in the other way and we're just going to make the drone fly basically upside down in beta flight. That's something very easy to do. That way we'll have both options and we only have to build basically two of these to have everything. Another limitation that this gimbal has is the fact that while you can control it using a, a remote from a different operator making it a dual operator system you can't go full disabled like you can do on a RS3, RS4, or even with a Inspire 3. At some point, there's a little bit of follow on the pan, and that is something that we have contacted HEQ uh, to try and fix. Uh, maybe it's a simple update where you can toggle a little switch and then it will completely disable everything so that you can, it won't follow any kind of movement. But so far, Martin, who's our camera operator, hasn't been too bothered by it. He actually thinks that it helps him frame a little bit better and understand where we're going. The last limitation of that setup is actually the DJI 04. It shoots 4K up to 60 FPS, which is fantastic, but the sensor is fairly small compared to other cameras. But that's kind of the price that you have to pay if you want to go this small. And being this small has a lot of advantages. When you are so small, you can fly under things, through things, and that really opens up possibilities in terms of creativity. That setup is also very interesting safety-wise. You can fly very close to people with it and chances are nothing will happen in case of a collision. However, a lot of people are currently building these in the hopes of being under 250 grams. Personally, I'm not really sure how this is possible because our current setup is about 300 grams without the battery. So that's almost 100 grams over. I'm not sure how much you can save on that, but for us, our choice has been to just be with the most optimal setup for our use, and that's what it is. Going back to the sub 250 gram uh, thing, the, the reason why people want to be under that weight is because they want to fly over crowds. And I still don't think flying over crowds is a good idea, even with a machine that is this small. The only way I think it could be okay-ish, it would be if you are under 100 grams. That is the moment where I think it's very difficult for something to happen. But 250 is quite big. It takes another size of propeller, and I think it's just too much to fly over crowds safely, you can hurt someone if it drops. So that's why I wouldn't recommend doing it. Now that we have gone over the specs, 
Maybe you wonder what kind of shots can you get with this thing? Well, let me show you. So is it a Mini Inspire 3? Well, not really, not quite yet. The specs are a little bit too small for it. And I mean, everything has shrunk. The capabilities, the flight time, by the way, two minutes and a half, something like this, 10 times less than the Inspire 3. It also doesn't do 8K, it only does 4K, so shrunk by half. Everything has been shrunk down, basically. However, is it a great new creative tool? I think so. I think this is something that we actually are going to use quite a bit because this is something that opens up new possibilities flying close to people through cars, through different kinds of obstacles. And I think it is really interesting. It, it's always interesting to bring a new perspective to the market. And I think that's something that this thing is doing. And in terms of quality, we are just there. It's very, very close to the quality of a GoPro. And I think it is basically the same, actually. So am I happy with it? Definitely. Am I going to use it in the future? Absolutely. Hey, uh, it's Editing Finky again. As I was finishing this video, Kim Tang actually had a great ID and he just posted it on his Instagram. Basically, he thought about using the same gimbal, but on the Avata 2. And that makes it fly a lot longer. And I think it's kind of an interesting take on it as well. So yeah, just wanted to add that up. If you have any questions or things that you think I may have left out on this setup, please let me know in the comments. And otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.